Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll add in a lot of applause. Yes. Um, right. Um, I'm assuming this group is here not just because it's raining outside or there's pizza, right? Um, the point of my presentation is obviously electric vehicles, plug-in vehicles 101. Uh, it's really intended for those who, who don't have electric vehicles. If you have an electric vehicle, if you had an electric vehicle, you may or may not learn something. You may, but this is really intended for folks who um, haven't bought or driven an electric vehicle, who are in the market, who think their next, next car might be an electric vehicle or some sort of plug-in. This is targeted for you. Um, the main point is to get you the information you need to make the right decision. The last thing I would want someone to do is think they, hey, all these people are getting electric vehicles, I want to get an electric vehicle too, and then realize it's not the right fit for you. And for a lot of people it is the right fit, but I would hate for someone to be, uh, make a decision that they're not going to, again, be happy with, especially since buying an electric car or any car is like the second largest purchase you have uh, next to buying a home. So. This information session is really for you to just to go in with a lot more information. So, but I'd love having this interactive. Um, if any questions pop up in your mind, either wait for it at the end or as there's a slide on and you want to talk about it, we can go into all kinds of level of detail. Um, and as well, if you just want to talk about electric vehicles afterwards, I've had just one-on-one -on -one discussions with people that know, I know a lot about electric vehicles, so I'll have just a little counseling session with them on, on before they make the purchase and I've, I've made a lot of electric vehicle converts so I'm really proud about that so again if you want to talk to me about any time electric vehicles obviously if you've already talked to me before you know how much I like talking about so let's just jump right in a little quick background about myself um, I realize I don't talk about this very much but um, I've been into electric vehicles for many many years um, it really started for me back in college um, Back in college, I joined a team of uh, engineering students that we built an electric vehicle by hand. Uh, that's me in the car um, on the uh, straightaway at the Indianapolis uh, Grand Prix, the 500, the track. Uh, I'm on the track there. That was actually an amazing experience. Um, we built this car, uh, and Hot Wheels was so impressed with it, they made a Hot Wheel of the car. Um, they, they turned it into an action pack. Thank you. They made it into an action pack, and they made me into an action figure in it. That's based, based off of that picture that uh, that was in the LA Times, and they said, we want to make that into an action figure. I'm like, yeah, go for it, right? So um, I've been doing this. Uh, this was in the early to mid-90s. So the electric vehicle industry was almost non-existent. You know, there was some conversions going on. Tesla was just this little gleam in this Elon Musk's eye, right? So um, it's taken a while for the industry to get to a point where it is now. And even now, I would still say it's burgeoning and, and, and not beyond nascent, but it's still growing. And there's a lot more room to grow. So um, I've been following it ever since. I bought my first electric vehicle in 2014. Uh, and I've been driving it and super happy with it and can't wait to get my next. So again, I have a lot of information and have learned a lot since then that really applies more towards how to live with an electric vehicle. It's not sound, but um, so again, I've learned a lot and I'm happy to share um, all of it with you. So let's talk a little bit basic terms uh, when it comes to electric vehicles. There's a lot of information out there. And sometimes um, I want to make sure people have the right basically even nomenclature and just to know when they're reading something what it actually means, right? Because there's a lot of information out there, a lot of good websites, but um, they don't always do a good job of giving people a lot of background, of like basic information. So this slide is just to really kind of get into a lot of the background. So when someone talks about a plug-in electric vehicle, it could be a lot of things. It could be a full battery electric vehicle. It could be a plug-in hybrid. They kind of like interchangeably use them. A hybrid vehicle is often confused with a plug-in hybrid vehicle, but a hybrid vehicle is something that has, actually has, still has a gas engine, but it has an electric motor as well, and we can, we can talk about how they're a little different. An electrified vehicle, I've been hearing this term a lot used by manufacturers when they're talking about how they're going to have a full electrified fleet you know, by 2025 or 2030. That doesn't mean all electric vehicles. It just means anything that might have an electric motor in it. So it could be a plug-in hybrid, it could be a full electric, it could be a regular hybrid vehicle, right? So even a hybrid vehicle is electrified. But so be careful when you hear terms like 
Ford is going to go full uh, electrified vehicles or you know Volvo. I've heard them say that, but it doesn't mean that the gas engine's gone away by any means. Um, when you hear me, you'll hear a term called internal combustion engine or ICE. You'll see that term. That basically means a gasoline or diesel engine, right? So you'll see that term tossed around a lot. And batteries. In the presentation, I'm just going to be using the term battery. And that really means the large lithium ion. It's usually a 400 volt battery pack. It's very large. Uh, that actually drives the motors. That's not the 12 volt battery in your car. Electric vehicles still have a 12 volt battery, just like almost any other car out there. So you'll hear me toss around that term too. But that's, that's different than the, and th that's really why I added this term. The drive motor or drive battery pack in most electric vehicles are either around 400 volts, and now some of the newer ones are coming out to be 800 volts. So they're very large battery packs. Not to be confused with the 12 volt battery pack that <coughs> turns off your lights and uh, radios and whatnot. So let's get into what a full electric vehicle is, right? So the most common ones out there, the Nissan Leaf's been around for many, many years. Um, it's very ubiquitous. The Bolt is becoming very, very popular. We all know the Teslas. These are all full 100% electric vehicles. Um, they have no gas engine. Uh, they're driven solely with an electric motor with electricity that's stored in the large battery pack. So I wanted to emphasize large because that's where you're going to see really the distinction between a hybrid vehicle, a plug-in hybrid vehicle, a range extending vehicle, and an electric vehicle. It's the size of the battery pack that's really the main difference between a lot of those. So you'll notice the numbers, you don't have to get hung up on the numbers, but they're roughly 40 to 100 kilowatt hours and future electric vehicles are even going to be bigger batteries. But 100 kilowatt hours, and we'll get into defining kilowatt hours in a minute, that's really how they size batteries. So think of it as almost the gas tank of the car, but it's storing electrons. Um, they're measured in kilowatt, kilowatt hours, so um, a full electric vehicle is somewhere between 40 to 100 kilowatt hours. Uh, the batteries are obviously plugged and charged only with a plug. There's no gas charging them at all. And they have obviously the greatest driving electric range of, or only electric driving range of between a hybrid or a plug, even a plug-in hybrid. They can do 390 miles and this number just keeps going up every year. Um, the model electric vehicle that I'm going to get next is probably going to have a plus 400 mile range. So they're just constantly growing. Plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So what is this? Um, these were originally hybrid vehicles that manufacturers realized that, you know, actually if we just put a bigger battery in them, we could actually get more of an electric range. So they, many of them started off as hybrid vehicles that are just more electrified. So they still have fuel and electricity though to drive uh, the motors. Uh, they use gas and electric motors. Uh, electricity is stored in a smaller battery pack than a full electric vehicle. You can see now the size of the numbers are significantly smaller than a full electric vehicle, although it's, they're, they're decent. They'll, they'll have a pretty decent amount of range. Um, but the batteries themselves are typically only charged with a plug, but that's sort of their benefit, right? They don't have to use the gas engine to generate electricity to charge the batteries. Uh, but they do have a lesser driving range than a pure electric vehicle, so somewhere 47 miles is a pretty good range for a plug-in hybrid vehicle, but that's pretty much the top end of a pure, pure plug-in hybrid. And again, if you have any questions and any models, just kind of shout it out. A hybrid vehicle, again, another area that, again, that's very confusing with people. Um, these are not plug-ins, um, and they're not to be confused with plug-ins, but um, they still have a gas engine, they have an electric motor. The electric motor, though, um, and the battery pack in them they're not charged externally. The, the, only the, power that get, the only power that gets into the battery pack is generated from the gas engine. Um, they have little to no electric range, meaning you as a driver have no ability to say, I want to go into just electric range because the batteries are so small, it's almost not possible to use them. So it's usually there's an onboard computer that controls how much the electric motor comes on and off and will drive the motors. So again, as a driver, you don't really get to say, I'm just going to go in all electric mode on uh, just a hybrid. Plug-in hybrids, you have a little bit more options to go into a full EV mode and drive only on batteries, but not so much on a hybrid electric vehicle. Uh, and you can see they have tiny uh, electric uh, battery packs. So these are, these are relatively small. Remember, those full electric ones are 40 to 100 kilowatt hours. Um, but you can see there, they typically are more conversions of regular vehicles because it's a lot easier for a manufacturer to put in these types of systems into a car that they already have. So 
they like to call this an electrified vehicle, and there's very little uh, additional infrastructure, or sorry, uh, capital outlay that they do in engineering to put a hybrid system in these things. So these will get out very quickly. They've been out for many years, but they're not really an electric vehicle if, if you're in the market for one. Manufacturers, though, then started coming up with other unique ways to say, okay, well, how can we actually extend the length of driving an electric vehicle uh, without having a giant battery pack? So there was this other classification of vehicle called a range extender. Um, there are not very many out there, um, and I see fewer of them are going to even continue because battery packs are getting so large now. But uh, there have been a few in the market, and the most uh, obvious ones were the Chevy um, Volt, not to be confused with the Volt, the Chevy Volt, which was out a while ago, and the BMW i3 uh, range extender. So range extender is actually unique in the BMW because you can actually get the same car with or without the range extender. It's the only car in the market that you can do that. The Chevy Volt was only a range extender. You couldn't not get it with a uh, gas engine. There's an interesting one in the market that I've been trying to come out. Um, I don't know, you might have heard of them. Uh, this was called uh, the Karma. It used to be called the Karma Fisker. It went through a different name. Now it's a Karma Rivero, I think. So um, they're a company. They're kind of a niche company. It's a, it's a luxury car. It is a range extender, but um, it's pretty expensive. I think it's like around $140,000 uh, or so. But it's a, well, it's in the eye of the owner, but I think it's kind of a, a cool looking car. But um, there are very few of them out there, but it's an option. But it's a range extender. How is it a range extender? It is fueled by electricity, but it can use a gas engine to generate electricity to recharge the battery packs. They've got a decent sized battery pack, about 18 to 42 kilowatt hours. Again, not as large as a full electric vehicle, but still pretty decent. They can operate as an electric vehicle most of the time. And it's only the additional range when you need that additional range does the gas engine actually do anything. And they have, again, pretty, pretty good electric range. I think the top end right now, the, the, the i3 is closer to 150 miles right now. So again, you can get pretty decent range for most people. And it gives you the ability to drive, to drive even further on gasoline if you need to. But if you don't need to go beyond that range, you actually never use electricity. So that's, that's one of their benefits. But again, electric vehicles now are getting such large battery packs that the high, the, this range extender classification is probably kind of going to probably pretty soon. So, um, I tossed around a bunch of units at you, uh, and I want to now kind of give you a comparison so you can understand how they're actually even uh, used and compared to what we're typically used with, uh, used to with an electric vehicle or a gas powered vehicle. So, let's talk about horsepower. Um, electric vehicles are classified, their electric motors are rated in kilowatts, um, but I also have seen them that um, horsepower used right next to it. And it's a, actually a simple conversion. I even included it for the, the mathematically, you know, um, not challenged, who want to make those conversions. One horsepower is equal to 0.745 uh, kilowatts. So you can see there's a direct uh, correlation. It's very similar. So three quarters of a kilowatt is the same as a horsepower. Um, gas cars obviously have gas tanks, and those are measured in gallons, because you that's how much you buy fuel in gallons. So the equivalent, uh, the, the closest equivalency in an electric vehicle is the size of the battery pack, because effectively it is your gas tank. It's where you store your fuel. Uh, gas tanks are rated, or sorry, battery packs are rated in kilowatt hours. So that's why I put that comparison. Um, in terms of, the, again, they're completely different units. They're completely different elements. But in terms of energy density, that's really where the big difference is between gasoline cars and battery cars. And why the gas engine has been so predominant for so many years, gasoline has a huge energy density. One gallon of gasoline has roughly 33.7 kilowatt hours of energy. Uh, if you compare that to what some of the other electric vehicles, how much even a large battery pack is, you know, that's only about three gallons worth of fuel in the largest Tesla battery. So you can tell gasoline is just very dense in energy, and that's why it's so difficult for engineers to figure out a way to wean power out of anything that you can pack into a small space. And again, lithium ion batteries are the, one of the best technologies we have, and they're gonna get better, but this is why it's taken so long to engineers to develop a large battery pack, but they're getting there. So again, just throwing out some numbers so that you have that information uh, in your back pocket. And in terms of efficiency, we all know miles per gallon is the term used for 
uh, gas powered cars. An electric vehicle, very similar, uh, miles per kilowatt hour, but not every manufacturer uh, uses that same t um, unit. Uh, Brent, you brought up this question. Um, does do all cars use this? I believe Teslas use watt hours per mile. So it's the inverse, basically. It's the same units, just an inverse, and this one's multiplied by a thousand uh, in the other unit. So it's the same unit, though. But again, just so you can, and, and we'll use this in a second. Uh, but just so you know how there's the equivalency between the the units. Any questions so far? Okay, great. So one of the big questions that everyone has about buying an electric vehicle, how do I charge it, right? So um, yes, there's lots of different ways you can charge it. So let's talk about charging basics here. So every electric vehicle pretty much sold in the United States uses a similar, if not the same standard to plug in and charge. Um, its official name is the Society of Automotive Engineers J1772 standard. So uh, that's the engineer, engineer in me getting that out. But it's pretty much just termed the J plug, just the plug. Um, the charging plug. You can see it, uh, that there, there's an example of it. Um, it's the same standard that we have here of all the charging stations we have here on the campus. Um, this type of charging infrastructure uh, comes in two flavors. There's one called level one and level two. The main difference between the level one and level two is obviously the power behind them. Uh, level one uses 120 volts, like regular residential outlet uh, AC power, but you can only get about one point eight kilowatts out of it. So use that term, you don't need to really know, again, if you understand back the batteries and how quickly you can put kilowatts into a battery pack, that'll help you understand. But really what's more important is to look at the relative difference between level one and level two. Level two uses 240 and can put about seven kilowatts, pulls about seven kilowatts of power, um, again, significantly about four times, almost four times the amount of power. The reason being is the amount of current they can draw, level one typically will only draw about 12 to 15 amps. Again, it's a, resident, a residential outlet, you can use level one, but residential outlets are typically limited to 15 to 20 amps, so you just can't draw a lot of power out of them. But level two, when you install a level two unit, you can pull 30 amps out of them, yeah. Are all uh, manufacturers required to have the same type of plug, or are they gonna be like the phones do and change plugs around for There's, There isn't per se a requirement, um, but they have settled on it. I mean, they, a lot of them do follow the Society of Automotive Engineers specifications. So that's why they did settle on the J1772 standard. And by talking about standard, one standard is the actual physical connector. Another standard is the architecture in the background, how the car actually speaks and the language it uses to talk to the charging infrastructure. That's also part of the standard as well. So yeah, all the manufacturers have settled on that standard but they do deviate a little bit on what else they do with it. For example, I'll get into the Tesla. The Tesla says, we'll use that in the background, but we're gonna make our own plug, and we're also gonna ride on top of that and be able to put more power into it. So, Can you plug a BMW into a Tesla charger? A Tesla, not directly, you not directly. Adapter, you can put an adapter, but again, we can talk about what a Tesla charger means, because there's different types. Just like there's type level one and level two, there's different levels of Tesla charging. And some of them you can plug in, any electric vehicle with adapter, some you can't. So we, we can talk about that afterwards. Good question though. Uh, another thing that I think is really important, this is probably one of the most important areas I probably should have highlighted more. But in terms of charging, um, level one adds about three miles per hour of charge. So every hour you're plugged in, you're adding about three miles of range in your car. Not the most appetizing, right? Level two, again, because you have significantly more power than putting out there, you're adding about 20 miles per hour of charge. So all these units that we have out here, they're, they're a pseudo level two because they're actually not charging at 240, they're about 208 because it's a commercial three-phase site. But um, they're adding just about the same. They're, it's closer to about 17 miles per hour. Of, or 17 miles of range that they charge per hour, that they're adding per hour. So think of these numbers, and we're gonna talk about the next level of charging uh, later on. So um, this, is, this is the sign right here, right? Um, so the level two charging stations and level one are probably the most common ones you can install them at your home. Um, the equipment can be installed, again, almost anywhere, uh, assuming you have the right uh, infrastructure to install them. The units are sold ubiquitously at Home Depot and Costco and Amazon. You could order them online. 
Um, I haven't actually found a, a brick and mortar store that actually sells them yet. Most of them are bought online, but I foresee a day that you'll actually be able to go to your charging station store. Uh, level one and level two are not fast charging though. People will toss around the term like, oh, let me plug into the fast charging. That's not fast charging. We're gonna talk about fast charging uh, in a minute here. In terms of cost, this is another one where people really wanna know like, uh, what is the difference, right? I was, I was helping out SCE at um, the Anaheim Auto Show and this was the most common question I had. People would come up to me was like, what does it cost? I have no idea what, how much energy I'm gonna use and what's the different cost. So that's why I made this slide. So in terms of a gas powered car, the efficiency, uh, again, these are numbers that I made up. You can plug in your own numbers if you want. Uh, but in terms of efficiency, um, a typical car um, might use, um, I'm sorry, this is the cost, right? So $3.5, that's the actual cost for the actual fuel. That's probably going to drop in the next month, right, to like <laughs> maybe $3 or $2.50. But that's roughly how much it costs to um, buy a gallon of fuel. Um, yeah, I moved these around, but I didn't change that name. The, um, here is the efficiency. I just picked that number, 30 miles to the gallon. Um, your average may vary, right? You might have a little bit more, a little bit less. But assuming these numbers, your driving, rough, your driving cost is roughly 12 cents per mile. Assuming these numbers, again, your numbers can go up or down. I have a Toyota Tundra at home, and it's half of this. So you, you half this, that number goes up to about 24 cents per mile. That's what it costs me to drive that Tundra with that amount of gas. Electricity, here's the comparison here. So electricity, this number is what I pay super off, um, sorry, uh, off, off, off peak, yes. Um, at night, it's 13 cents per kilowatt hour. That's not on peak, and again, everyone's uh, tariff may vary, uh, depending on your home and your utility. But uh, for the most part, if you're charging in the evening, you can get this rate if you're on a time of use rate structure. Um, this is actually another number that is, again, not commonly known, but use this in, your back, in the background when you're actually thinking from any electric vehicle. This number also varies. This is the efficiency in miles per kilowatt hour. Um, I've seen people drive very inefficiently. You can drive an electric car as inefficiently as any other car. So this number can be as low as one, two, um, typically is three. I, I could do four every day, and sometimes it's not uncommon for me. I drive pretty conservatively, so I can see five miles per kilowatt hour. So there's a big swing, but in average, you're talking about three to five kilowatt hour or miles per kilowatt hour. So that's why I just picked four. At this rate, this is how much it costs me to drive per mile. So again, and I wanted to give it a number that's kind of comparable, right? So for the size of car, a small car like what I drive, the equivalent could be about 30 miles per gallon. Um, and even still, it's you know four times less per mile. That's a huge difference, and then you multiply that over a year or the life of the vehicle, that's a huge savings in cost only, in, in fuel only, obviously. But that's where the big difference is in charging electric like vehicles. I also came up with this number. Um, the federal government has different ways to show these numbers and sometimes they're pretty confusing but there's one number that I like using that's this e-gallon equivalent so if you were charging your vehicle with electricity it's the effective rate of buying a gallon of gas at 98 cents per gallon so that's effectively what the same distance you're getting and the efficiency that you're getting out of using electricity to charge a car as opposed to gas so I, I just made this slide and when I put it together, I'm like, this is really numbers that people need to understand. The, the, the huge difference between a gas powered car and electric vehicle, so, yeah. Um, Roman, are you taking into account, like, with that number, if you're charging at night, getting the discounted rates, is, does that the, the, This is about as good as it gets. Okay. Um, I could tell you, like, for example, from in my home, because I am off of, uh, on the, it's a grandfather time of use rate, which isn't available now. The uh, time of use prime is now the standard. So I think this number, as good as it gets, it might be 14% kilowatt hour. I, I can't be sure. I can tell you at, at peak, it was closer to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So I would never charge in the middle of the day at home, right? It makes, it's much cheaper to charge even here, uh, which we can talk about. Charging also varies. This is if you're charging at home, where you are metered per kilowatt hour. When you're charging in the wild, in public, 
Um, a lot of those charging stations uh, don't charge you, they don't meter you per kilowatt hour, they meter you per time, right? So whether you're using a full level two or trickling off and using less, sometimes they don't really change. As soon as you plug in and they start delivering electricity, the meter starts and it doesn't stop, even if that kilowatt hour keeps dropping. So just something to keep in mind, and we can, I can talk to you a little bit more about how that varies, but sometimes it's still very efficient, though, compared to gas. So, good questions. I got a question. Yes. Um, what does hills and stuff like that, does it affect both vehicles about the same? About the same. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I, although I will tell you, though, that electric vehicles are much better at dealing with traffic than a gas-powered car. Uh, for two reasons. Um, a gas-powered car just likes to stay at a constant speed. It doesn't like to be changing up and down, up and down. So accelerating, decelerating, they just, it just doesn't do well. Actually, no car. I mean, it takes the most energy you use in any vehicle is when you're accelerating. Right. But electric vehicles, though, have the advantage of that when you come to a stop, all the power stops as well. Plus, they are just better geared at starting from a complete stop to a full speed. Whereas a gas-powered car isn't, um, it has to shift through gears. So it has to be in one gear at a very start, and then go to a second gear, and a third gear, and a fourth gear. So they're just not as efficient at accelerating and decelerating like an electric vehicle. Like. So just from a, from a fuel standpoint, it probably is more of an issue on, a, on, on an ICE vehicle than it is on an electric vehicle? In traffic. But the inverse happens, though, uh, or the opposite happens when you're driving at a constant speed. At a constant speed, that's where gas-powered cars would like to be, at a constant speed and driving you know, somewhere you know, in the 50, 60 miles an hour. That's where their best efficiency is. They're on the highest gear, and the engine's running at a constant speed. Uh, electric vehicles, that's when you start to, their efficiency starts to drop off because, again, they're very efficient. But um, what really starts impacting them then is literally, it's just physics, it's uh, aerodynamic drag. As the aerodynamic drag goes up, that electric motor has to push and push and push more air, and it's stuck in one gear. So the higher speeds you get to, its efficiency starts to drop off. So in my, my car, for example, I see a significant drop in the efficiency after I start driving above 65 miles an hour. 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, it really starts tanking because you're pushing a significant amount of air. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't change gears. It's still stuck in that same gear. Yeah? Yeah, the other benefit in your traffic is it's got regenerative braking. Oh, right. Cars to sell as you slow down. I totally forgot that electric cars could make electricity as they're driving. Yeah, so most electric vehicles, pretty much all of them, use the electric motor to make electricity. So that same, and, and this is why I love electric vehicles so much, because they're just physics machines, literally. They, they use energy to get up and add that electric energy, potential energy, and turn it into you know, mechanical energy, and now you have your momentum, and then it uses that momentum in reverse and converts it right back to potential energy right into electricity. So, um, yeah, I totally forgot about regenerative braking. Yes, thanks. All right, again, excellent questions. I love all the questions. So, now we're getting into fast charging. And this is the one question everybody has. Um, and that's really one of the big advantages that Tesla has because they have a huge DC fast charging network out there, which is a really a real amazing selling point for them. So, in terms of DC charging, there are two standards out there, I'll call them. Um, there's the, a very common one um, called Combo or CCS. Um, that's what I have on my car, it's, it's very common. Um, on most electric vehicles have that one that, that aren't Teslas. Um, most Japanese cars use a standard called Chatmo, and uh, I, I try to get them in terms of scale, how big the plugs are, uh, all these in turn actually. Um, so you can see the differences between them. Um, the combo one actually was built on the SAE 1772 standard that I talked to you about. It actually, this is the 1772 plug, and then they added these two additional plugs at the bottom to, because this is designed for AC power, and this is DC power. I literally mean alternating current and direct current. The fastest way you can dump power into a battery pack is through direct current, because the batteries themselves use direct current, they're batteries. So the fastest way to send that power into them is through direct current. So they use uh, those plugs for that. Same thing in the Chasmo. Tesla, early on, um, for their own reasons, and I, I understand why, um, they wanted to develop their own standard for um, charging their electric vehicles. Again, they've had this long-term plan of, again, how the vehicle's gonna look, and 
um, how they're going to fit the charging infrastructure in their car, and didn't want to go with either one of these standards, so they developed their own. And this is, relatively speaking, about the same size as the plug. I, I really like their design. It's pretty slick. And it works on AC and DC at the same time. But just so you can see, there are physical differences between these. So most Japanese electric vehicles use this standard. Almost all other electric vehicles use this standard. But Teslas use this standard. So yeah, so back to your point, uh, Jerry. These are, there are changes in differences in standards. Um, this one, this DC charging standard that Tesla uses, um, it is proprietary. Um, you can't plug into this one if you don't have a Tesla because mainly um, this system, when you pull up to a Tesla supercharging station, it actually communicates with the vehicle through these communication pins and will actually check like which electric vehicle is this, which Tesla is this, who is the owner, um, and did we authorize this vehicle? Then only then will allow it to start sending power into it. Whereas you can have another exact same vehicle uh, pull up to it, um, but isn't on the list of approved um, Teslas that can use a supercharging station, and it won't work. So that's that's a, well, mainly a lot of the reasons why they have that protective. Um, they develop their own standard so that they can control who who can and can't use a lot of their systems. So, so Rowan, just to be clear then, so if you're driving a Tesla and you come to Edison, yes, can you plug in without using yes. an adapter? To you will need an adapter because this is the inverse of this. This plug right here is what the Tesla sees, uh, is has physically on it. But the connectors here look like this. So, but all Teslas actually come with that adapter. Okay. So when you come up to here, the level two units, you slip on that adapter that came with the car um, over this port and it fits into the port that this plugs into. Yeah. yeah, so Tesla did design their system to be backwards compatible, to use that term, with the standard um, SAE standard. So the Tesla supercharger is a, an extra, like a, a premium uh, charge would be assessed. You have to join the club, in other words? Yeah, basically, the, uh, yes. They have, you have to be on the list. So for example, it, it's not even if you just get any Tesla, right, because Again, two exact same Teslas bought at different years, for example. When you bought the car, you also bought into the system that, uh, that puts you on that list that say, yes, you have access to these uh, supercharging networks. There's, there's actually an interesting story going on about a guy who, um, some of you might have heard him, uh, who likes to rebuild Teslas. So he buys um, salvaged Teslas. And up until recently, he was able to go up to the systems and plug in. But Tesla's been getting a little smarter and saying, hey, actually, um, we didn't think about those uh, salvaged Teslas. Yeah, we don't actually want them charging. So they just sent the signal out to the system, and now all those got kicked off the list. So he can't charge anymore. Nothing changed in this. It's just Tesla said, no, you can't charge here anymore. It's their system. They can control who gets on it and who can't. So, but, but that's again. just for their superchargers. Just for the superchargers, yes. Nothing changed in this plug. Right. You can still pull up to a level two unit, put the adapter on, it yeah. works. Yes, because again, there is no checking of exactly. who's approved, who's not approved. Literally, when you pull up to one of these units here, the, these units are actually, in almost all these level two units, are, are they're kind of just dumb boxes. They're literally just a switch. Your car literally turns it on. There's not even power in the plug. When you walk, you could literally, I wouldn't suggest it. <laughs> Put your tongue right on the plug. There is no power in there. You have to plug it into the car. The car then communicates to the unit and says, uh, yeah, I need power. Um, go ahead and turn on. I understand that, again, it's the protocol for communicating. It's called a handshake. It says, uh, yes, I actually need power. And go ahead and turn on. It turns the, closes the switch. And then the car draws the power. And when the car is done, it tells it, OK, close the switch. I need to unplug. But as, as it pertains to uh, privacy and all that, is, are you aware if Tesla is using that to say if somebody steals your car, it'll, it says don't charge this anymore or something like that? Or, or even I, I would imagine that that's probably not a smart move for a, someone who stole a car to go to a supercharging station because, again, they'll know, Tesla would automatically know, oh, the car's over there now or now it's over there. So they could follow it, yes. But, again, it, what they're doing on the background with that information, I don't know. But again, every time a car plugs in, they know where you are. They know where you're plugging in. Yeah. All right, so charging in the wild, charging in public here. Um, and how are we doing on time here? Okay, we're doing pretty good. 
Um, there, so public charging stations, uh, there are many of them out there. I just listed a, a, some of the more common ones um, that support level one, level two, and DC fast charging. Most of them require a membership. You have to sign up for them in advance. Uh, a lot of them in the early days uh, required an RFID card to activate it. Not all of them do. Some are going to now, even these are going to a contactless system. Um, but membership into these uh, programs is usually free. Um, but even uh, free charging stations, like at some at municipalities or city halls or public spaces, stations um, that don't charge you to use them, many of them still require you to be part of some sort of network so that they can just authorize and turn the system on and off. So you have to sometimes be part of these, these membership programs, but not necessarily still actually pay. Um, I listed some of the most common ones. Charge point, blink, I don't even know why I listed on here, it's kind of going away. Uh, Green Lots is the one that's listed here, um, which interestingly enough, Green Lots was bought by Shell. So now it's Green Lots, a Shell company. Yeah, well, just think of it, let that settle in a little bit. Um, and um, in terms of the uh, DC charging stations, the two biggest ones out there, the networks are EVgo and Electrify America. The interesting thing about these two companies, though, um, EVgo was started out of the, out of, um, it's called a settlement from the energy crisis here in California, uh, when the large uh, power producers were caught manipulating uh, electric prices. One of the um, stipulations, the settlement agreements was that one of them would start a DC charging company. So that's why EVgo got started. And e, uh, Electrify America was also part of a settlement um, that was from Volkswagen related to Dieselgate. Uh, they settled litigation with the EPA and said, okay, we'll start a DC charging network and roll it out all over the country. But again, because of a settlement. So um, it's interesting how these things come around. Yeah. So if you're in a pinch and you uh, find a charging station and you're not a member to use that one, can, can you, through your phone, join and have yes. it activated like now or is there a way? I'll, I'll say it's possible and that's actually happened to me. Like for example, I was uh, coming to work and I really wanted to charge at a station um, and there was a station that I saw on my car at my local um, Kaiser um, doctor's office. So I pulled up there, I'm like, okay, well, which network is this? And I'm like, SEMA Connect. I'm like, okay, I don't have a SEMA Connect. But literally, I just go onto the Apple Store, download their app, sign up in about five minutes, and I'm a member. Okay. And then it just activated it. Yeah, and it was free. So um, again, not all of them are. But yes, it could be that quick. Yeah, I'll oftentimes, some of them will have a port of porch, point of purchase mechanism, so you can scan with a credit card. I've seen that, it's usually like most of the a little bit more expensive. I'll, I'll let you know, DC charging, like these two uh, networks and all the private ones, are actually, there's a premium for, for charging at them because, again, you can charge very, very fast. Oftentimes, I, I can't get away with charging at one of these networks without paying probably about $5. But I could fill up my car very quickly um, on those. So I use them as needed. Um, and again, that's why some of these have um, a point of purchase, so they'll have a credit card swipe. Um, I haven't seen that so much in the green lots or the charge point ones, but um, but because they're fairly cheap, it, oftentimes when I use a green lots or a charge point, uh, I only charge with sorry like Some of them out here. yeah uh, you can use a credit card mm -hmm. on this one so the green lots does use it. I haven't seen a lot of charge points that use credit cards, <laughs> but again I, I I pay 75 cents or a dollar maybe to fill up my car at these units. So so you're literally putting. Quarters in no, I use uh, I use the app, oh. right? So I use the app, and now actually now with my phone, uh, it uses a contactless. Um, so I literally just bring out my phone, hold it near the unit, it activates, and I plug it right into the car. When yeah. you refer to it very quickly on these superchargers, what's the charge? Uh, oh, actually, thanks for bringing that up because I had it listed down here. 150 miles per hour. Okay, someone. Say who? But the Tesla is even better. Version three superchargers are a thousand miles in an hour. Yeah. Up to. Oh, this just says the battery fills to capacity and charging slows. It starts to drop off. Yeah. But yeah, a supercharger version three is a thousand miles an hour. That's dumping lots of kilowatts into the battery pack. Very big. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the bigger bigger charging units are because they're pumping so much power. They are liquid cooled cables now because the copper is starting to get pretty warm inside there. So. Yes, thanks for bringing that up. But yeah, that's why um, DC charging is really, um, 
it was, it was a game changer. When I bought my electric vehicle in 2014, electric, the DC charging system on my car was actually an option. Um, it was a $500 option back then. And in California, there was four, four DC charging stations in California uh, back in 2014, yeah. But I said, no, I, they're, they're coming. I, I, it's it's going to be an option, and I need to pay that. So I, I bought the, the, I paid for the option. And within, you know, three years, there was hundreds of them. So I'm glad I did. And actually by 2015, it became a standard. So it was just the timing of it. But yes, almost every electric vehicle now, uh, it's standard. And make sure that it does. Uh, because again, it does give you that option that, again, of being able to charge very quickly, right? Again, really good. Thanks for bringing that up. Another thing, that, another question that people also have questions on is how much money am I going to get back for buying this electric vehicle? So let's get into that. So the financial incentives and some of the perks. The uh, federal tax credit, not a refund, it's a credit uh, off your taxes, is still in place, uh, but it, it is varying. Um, and from year to year, whether it's there or not, you never know. But uh, it reduce, and it, it actually reduces when the manufacturers, any manufacturer reaches 200,000 vehicles. So for example, uh, Tesla and I think GM um, and Nissan are, if they haven't already hit that number, they're very close. I think Tesla already did, hit it last year. But what that means is that when, after they've sold their 200,000th vehicle, um, the first quarter after that, that incentive gets cut um, in half in the first quarter, and the next quarter it gets cut in half again. So the Teslas, I think, are, I don't know, somebody, we're, obviously we're down into about this number here, and I don't know if it even exists anymore at all. Yeah, it's gone, yeah. So, but some of the other manufacturers, um, I think they're just about gone, GM as well. But for now, there's a whole bunch of other manufacturers that are just starting to sell electric vehicles, right? So Volkswagen, um, Ford is going to be start selling an electric vehicle, Volvo, uh, Audi, Jaguar, uh, BMW hasn't hit those numbers yet. So there's still many, many more electric vehicles that will still have that available for you. So um, it's not a percentage of the vehicle cost. It's a flat 7,500 bucks. Yes. The reduced amount if you're... It, it's a credit. It's actually, I think it's called the alternative fuel credit um, on your tax form. Yeah. And is it, is it per company or is it per car type? Per company. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So this, the Tesla lost it because it, le it counted all the Model S's, Roadsters, Model X's, Model 3's. I don't so just, just so I understand the federal tax credit, so if I, you know, if I bought a car this year or next year I file on my taxes, I put down that I bought a car, so I get this refund, let's yes. say it's still, they haven't sold 200,000 cars. Does that mean that I will get $7,500 more back or my it's a credit? It's a credit, right? So it just goes into the credit line. Of, yeah. So pretty much if you make more than $30,000, you will have more than a $7,500 liability. So it will offset that. So if you are, say, if you are like around $40,000, $50,000 uh, a year, um, that will virtually offset most of that. But um, yeah, if you're making 100,000 or 200,000, it's just $7,500 off your tax liability, right? Okay. So your tax liability might be $20,000, $15,000. It's, it's $7,500 off of that. Okay. Um, yeah, it just reduces that tax amount. Okay. It's it's not the same as how much you owe, though, right? How much you owe depends off of your withholdings, and everyone's different, right? So, uh, good question. So, the clean vehicle, the, the California Clean Vehicle Rebate Program, um, is re income restricted, but it is a twenty-five hundred dollar check that you get from the state of California. Well, actually, it's administered by I think the California Air Resources Board. But um, it's now income restricted, so I believe if you make over, I want to say $150,000, you cannot apply for this. That just started a year or two ago. Um, I actually applied for this twice on my first vehicle in 2014, and then my second one in 2017, um, I applied for it twice. But now I'm, I can no longer apply for that. Um, Here's another incentive, Long Beach electric vehicle charging giveaways. If you sit, live in the city of Long Beach, they are giving away electric vehicle charging stations. The station itself, you still have to pay to install it, but um, you could apply for that. SCE, I think they stopped this one. I know they definitely stopped the uh, home installation rebate, but the Clean Fuel Rewards Program, I'll have to check on that. I think it's still available, actually. Um, but. These programs are constantly changing, so I always have to keep adjusting this. 
Um, and AQMD has a residential EV charging incentive pilot program. Again, it may be there, it may not be there, but again, just want to list that there are lots of different programs available uh, to offset some of these costs. Yes? Not a financial incentive, but it's car carpool stickers are available to the state government. Thank you for bringing that up. Because there's also uh, perks. So there's the Clean Air Vehicle HOV decal program. Uh, that a lot of people are like, some people buy an electrified plug-in vehicle just for this alone, just to get, um, there's some executives that I know that I won't mention names that just buy an electric vehicle just so they can get this carpool sticker. But um, this program has also been changing. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that they actually all have a sunset period. So uh, my car has actually red stickers that expire on uh, January 1st, 2022. Uh, you see a lot of people that have purple stickers these here, those actually will expire by January 1st, 2023. And the latest ones are the orange ones, um, expire um, January 1st, 2024. So they do have a sunset period. You, you don't, for the life of a vehicle, get to drive in the carpool lane. It's just for a limited period of time. Um, I don't know what's gonna, what color's gonna be after. I don't know if California's gonna change it eventually. A lot of people like don't like the fact that there are stickers, They'd rather just put it on the registration and, you know, or put it on the, 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 the sticker that you're already putting on your license, but who knows? But every state does it a little differently. California does it with these stickers. Um, fast track toll road discount rates, if any of you are, use the full toll roads. Uh, LA Metro used to have free um, access to the toll roads. Um, starting in 2019, they just reduced it, so it's no longer free. But a reduction is a reduction. Um, and we have dedicated parking spaces here. Um, for low emission vehicles and clean air vehicles. I don't know why they switch names and on different buildings they'll may have a sign in front of it and some don't, but these were actually California standards for high efficiency buildings to incentivize people to buy electric vehicles to park in premium spaces, but um, another program. And it, it varies from building to building and even the terms that they use vary. Do you have any idea, Roman, what the discount is to the local fast track toll roads? Is it like the toll, well, and the problem is obviously these toll roads, they're all different too. They're all, that while they all use the same standard, uh, fast track transponder, they're all independent. So LA only runs the 10 and the 110. Um, that's different than the 91, which is run by a net different network. That's different than the, was it 241? Yeah, which called themselves the toll road. Um, all those are different networks and they offer different rates. So you have to be part of them. So for example, the 91, yeah. they have a different rate structure, but you have to be part of their program to get their rate structure. So is a discount like 20%, is it 50%? Is yeah, it, it's, it's actually, it's, it's like 50%, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's a pretty significant amount. Yeah. Are you saying you have to be a member of all three of those? They're no, all no. Like all of them actually will communicate with the network. But when you get on there, so they'll read it. So like, I can drive on the 91, but I will just be seen as just any other driver on the 91 freeway. They won't necessarily see my vehicle as an electric vehicle. They don't know that because I'm not part of their network. So they'll just to communicate with my transponder, but I'm not part of their network. So like they'll just charge me the regular carpool rate, not a discounter. Like for example, in Metro, when they did have the, the free access, it was free to me for me to be on there. But the same day, if I drove down to the 91, I would have to pay even though my transponder worked on there. So they just see you as just another driver. Okay. Yes? Well, I was gonna, just the one comment about the carpool sticker, so that, that's limited number of cars per that type of car. Like, if it, like you said, the S, the Tesla so S. So that's been that changing too. Yeah. That's so been changing too. So originally, actually, for example, the green stickers, when they first came out, there were only 15,000 that they put out and they, blew through those very quickly, and then the state added more, and they added more. I don't know that they're limited right now, but again, they can change the programs all, all the time. So just because you get a, what I was getting at is just because you get an electric vehicle doesn't necessarily mean you get a carpool sticker. So you gotta be wary of that, and there I, is a, a place you can go look for I would them. suggest, um, I would suggest to, yes, remember all this information and verify before you actually make any commitment. So I know we have only a few more minutes. Uh, I just kind of wanted to go through the list of what's out there. This slide was actually much smaller when I first started doing this, but obviously they keep changing, so I keep updating it as quickly as I can. My friend has, I convinced her and she loves her, her iPace. Uh, again, these are the more, some of the more common ones. Uh, again, see there's some of the new ones. I, I 
really like to see more of the uh, Narrows and the Kona. Kona really has an amazing range. It's also, I think, somewhere around 300 mile range. Um, again, 265. 265, yeah, just amazing range in some of these vehicles. Um, as And again, uh, reasonably priced vehicles. Some of the future ones now, because I've been doing this for a while, now they're not feature anymore. They're actually available. I've seen already model Ys on trailers already getting ready to be delivered. The Porsche Taycan is going to be coming out this year. E-trons are already out there. Some of these VW ones are, uh, again, in the offing. Um, I'm going to buy either one of these two. I'm not sure which one yet, but they're not coming until the end of the year. Mini, there's going to be an electric Mini. Uh, there's a couple other companies, new co companies. Biden is another one. Um, you would mentioned um, Faraday. There's, there's a few other companies that are just, just off in the wings that, again, if they can get funding and really ramp up to get into production, there may be even more that are coming out there. So, is Rivian a new car company? Yeah. Rivian is a brand new car company, yeah. They've been in stealth mode developing the car for about nine years. So um, they had a huge influx from Amazon. Ford dropped like half a billion dollars into them to develop, and they actually will be developing one of their next electric Lincolns. Rivian will be developing it for them. And they're going to be uh, producing 100,000 electric delivery vehicles for Amazon. Wow. So I'm like, but wait, build my car first. <laughs> <laughs> I put a deposit down too. Yes. Maintenance, yeah, good question. So um, my electric vehicle has had very little maintenance. Um, what I've had to go through in um, recently was check the brakes, but the brakes were fine. So I've had 70,000 miles and the brakes are still uh, like new. Uh, these th things, most of these electric vehicles are just, they're modern cars. So they have lots of other subsystems that even gas powered cars. So you still have an air conditioning system you have you know, ventilation systems, you have anti-lock brake systems, so all those could still fail just like any other car, but the big things like oil changes, you don't have to do. Transmission changes, you really don't have to change your transmission. They're single gear, they don't have complex automatic transmissions. Um, yeah, the maintenance is, is very, and actually my brother has an electric vehicle, he has like 90 to 100,000 miles on his leaf, and he hasn't spent any maintenance on the car. He's had it since 2014. So, and it's still running fine. So it's, the maintenance is, I, I don't say there's no maintenance, but it's significantly less. For <laughs> some of the bigger ones are the more common ones. Yeah. Um, what about actual repairs? Um, is there schools that are, are some programs or they training uh, students on how to fix electric vehicles? Yeah, so it varies uh, quite a bit from car to car. Uh, again, you still have likely will have to get them repaired, you know, at a dealer though. But some of the things, for example, the common things that start breaking down, you don't have nearly the same number of subsystems. So you don't have water pumps, you don't have oil pumps, you don't have fuel pumps. Uh, the air conditioning condensers are very are simplified. So those things are not likely to happen. But you still likely will still have because again, they're complex cars. They still have many other systems that can break down. I know we're wrapping up on time here. One of the quick things I want to show you is that, again, if you have access to this information, I think it was in the presentations, but yeah. find, go to these sites. These are great resources for finding out more information about uh, electric vehicles. Um, I'll, I'll put a plug in for PlugShare. That's actually a really good source for information, but cars.se.com uh, for some of the rebates. And here's another one for uh, electric vehicle charging networks, just some of the more common ones that you should know about. So. Again, thank you so much. I love the questions all. And come see me if you have any more questions. So. Thank you. Thank you.